bulletin. I'm going to be reading the scripture from the pastor's corner in the bulletin this morning rather than the new international version uh, of the Pew Bibles. And this is the New King James Version. Uh, how long has it been since I've, I've read from, from that? Uh, but I'd like for us to read Isaiah 43, 16 through 19 from the New King James Version. And here goes. Thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea and a path through the mighty waters, who brings forth the chariot and horse, the army and the power, they shall lie down together, they shall not rise, they are distinguished, they are quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things, and that would include last year's Super Bowl. <laughs> Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Behold, I will do a new thing. Let us pray. We're expectant of that new thing that you're going to do. Help us to be open to it and to receive it gladly. Speak to our hearts, we pray, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now here I stand. Here I stand this morning with a Bible in English, in my hands. Do you know how incredible this is? I mean, do you realize what kind of historical journey it takes to get to this point that a preacher in Carver, Massachusetts would be reading from a Bible in English? You might have no idea of the twist and the turns and the heroism that it took to get us to this point. So I want to tell you about it. A long, long time ago, some 3,000 years in a land far, far away, a people of God were journeying with God and the Hebrews began to write down their stories. Stories of Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Stories of Sarah and Rebekah and Rachel and Esther and Ruth, stories of all the great heroes and heroines of the faith, stories of King David and of those mighty prophets, Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah. 3,000 years ago, they wrote those stories down in Hebrew. Then, 2,300 years ago, 70 Jewish scholars went to Alexandria, Egypt to translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. Now, right there, right there, was the first impulse to translate the text into a language that others could understand. So others could encounter these great stories and these great truths. 
But it wasn't until about 1,600 years ago that Pope Damascus declared that the Bible should be written in Latin. In Latin, the language of scholars and clerics so that the Bible could be carefully studied. But you might not realize how long this journey is. It was not until the year 1363 that a scholar from Queen's College in Oxford, England, by the name of John Wycliffe, decided that it was time for the Bible to be written in English. It was in Latin. It was in the hands of clerics, scholars. Only the scholars could read it. But Wycliffe believed, Wycliffe believed that there was a true spiritual church that was so beautiful, but the visible church, uh, the organized religion of his day, was impeding the view of the beauty of Jesus Christ. So he thought, if I can just write down the Bible in English, people could encounter for themselves the glory of Jesus Christ, and that would make the spiritual church truly visible. So he and his students began to translate the Bible into English, and they began to pass around their manuscripts. Now, this is before the printing press. They passed them around so that butchers, and bakers and plowmen could encounter Jesus Christ for themselves in the gospel. But oh, this made the church very, very uneasy. Because you see, if people were reading the Bible for themselves, they just might discover that a lot of the doctrines and the dogma of the church might not have good scriptural warrant. This is dangerous. They might, they might come to their own understanding of Jesus Christ. They might develop their own theology and not take the party line of the church. This is dangerous. So, are you, are you with me? In the year 1415, Bibles in English were declared illegal. In 1415, Wycliffe, listen, Wycliffe was dead at this point. As a matter of fact, Wycliffe, John Wycliffe had been dead for 44 years. And you know what? He was posthumously declared a heretic. After he's dead, he's declared a heretic. And you know what they did? His body was exhumed and burned at the stake. Bibles in English. Oh, that's too revolutionary. That's too radical. So the church and society outlawed any Bibles in English. But some of those English manuscripts were still in existence. And you see, this, this idea held on. I mean... Why can't people have the scriptures in their own language? Why can't they read it for themselves? It took another hundred years until William Tyndale had the courage to say, it is time 
to have the Bible in English. And so he began to pass around some manuscripts. But you know what happened? The Bishop of London outlawed it. And, and, and they held a public book burning. Now, I don't know, you may have thought that the, the original book burnings came from, you know, Bible thumpers that are so pious that they want to burn all the books that are salacious. But no, no. The original book burnings were Bibles, Bibles in English. The Bishop of London had William Tyndale strangled to death as a heretic. And you know what? Even after he was dead, they burned his body at the stake. Are you beginning to see what a treasure this is? That we have the Bible in English? You know, any idea like having the Bible in the language of the people, that idea cannot be killed. People should have it for themselves. And they should experience Christ more directly in the gospel. Not just through what the authorities say, the government says, or the church says. So these manuscripts in English continued to be passed around. And by the way, William Tyndale, as he was being strangled to death, the story is told that his last words were, God opened the eyes of the king of England. But the king of England at the time was Henry VIII, and he had other things on his mind. The Bible was, was still suppressed and then, and then in 1553, 1553, Mary Tudor ascends to the throne and she makes it crystal clear. No Bibles in English. And she was even more harsh in her punishment. She opposed English Bibles, Bloody Mary, we call her, and, and she burned some 250 dissent, religious dissenters and made it clear the law of the land is no Bibles in English. I mean, she was fierce. She was harsh, and that suppression worked. Listen to how long this journey is. In the year 1604, James of Scotland came to the throne. And James of Scotland believed that it is now time to have the Bible in English. The Bible to be accessible to all people in their native tongue. So he ordered teams of scholars from uh, Oxford and Cambridge and Westminster to work on an English translation of the Bible. And you know what? In the year 1611, there was produced what was known as the King James Bible. And that is the, the English Bible that American Christianity was based upon. But oh, what a journey. What a journey to get the Bible in our language. But the journey continues. The journey continues. You have to constantly be making decisions about how you will translate the Bible from Hebrew and Greek and Latin into English. You have to make a lot of choices. As one scholar said, every translation of a masterpiece is a failure. 
Uh, you know, you will miss some of the rhythm and some of the beauty. Uh, you, you will ruin the cadence. Language can become turgid and slow and sideways. Every translation does not capture the true masterpiece. So we keep trying new translations. Today there is a plethora of Bibles in English. Uh, you know, because no, because no one of them is perfect. Uh, we've got the New International Version. We've got the Revised Standard, the New Revised Standard, the New English Bible. Today's things, on and on and on. A plethora of English Bibles. All right, now, now I've got your attention. Now, I've got you to the point where I want to tell you what happened to me this last week. I was reading a poem from William Blake. And there was a line from that poem that jumped out at me and grabbed me. And it so captivated me, I've been thinking about it all week long. Do you know what it was? William Blake said, we become what we behold. Listen to that. Listen to that. We become what we behold. So I got to thinking, in our time, in our day, with all of the media and all of the news and all of the politics around us, all of the media that is so violent and so vapid and so superficial and so silly, what if we behold that stuff too much? Is that what we become? We become what we behold. So I began to think about that word, behold. And I thought about all the key moments in the scriptures where behold is spoken. I remember the first chapter of Genesis, you know, where God created everything and God said, um, God said, be, after God had created everything, he said, behold, God saw that it was good. To behold, to behold is to receive its impression. To behold is to appreciate and to become more reverent. To behold, God took creation into God's own heart. To receive its impression. I thought about the book of Revelation. We read this scripture at Lee's service yesterday. Behold, I make all things new. Behold, my dwelling will be with humanity. I thought about in the Gospels, John the Baptist pointing to Jesus. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I even looked at the Christmas story again, and I remember the angel saying, Behold, I bring you glad tidings of great joy. I thought about our scripture today in Isaiah. Behold, I am doing a new thing. And so I went to my Bible to look up other scriptures with behold in it and Lo and behold, I couldn't find any. It's gone. That word behold, it's gone. And I learned that since 1990, translators of English Bibles have taken it out. Now we use the more banal word 
to see or to look. I don't know. I don't know about you. I, I just think that uh, it, it seems we've lost so much poetry and depth to behold, to fully appreciate, to receive empathetically its impression. I don't know. Scholars may be a, a, a little uh, too smart for their, their britches here. I love that word. Behold. I couldn't find it anymore. So you know what? I decided I'm going to preach on it anyway. <laughs> that word is beautiful to behold. And I got to thinking about it. I thought, am I doing that? Am I beholding things? Not, not just looking at them or just seeing them, but and, and to behold. I thought about all the people that would be crossing my path this last week. And, you know, people um, here are, are in the coffee shop or in the grocery store. Just, you know, am I taking the time to behold these people? Or am I just observing them? Do I appreciate each one? Am I beholding them? And so guess what? I decided right then and there that I was going to try a new experiment. And I want to recommend this to you for this week. I decided that every person that, I, that ran across my path, I was going to think of two things, two, two things to appreciate to, to really behold it, not one. I mean, we can always come up with a, a quick one, like a smile or, or, you know, this person's comportment is pleasant, whatever. No, come up with two. You know, we live in a society that is so critical, and, and we're so quick to see the downside of things, we're too quick to observe shortcomings. What would it be like to really behold people? To grow in my sense of appreciation. I tell you what, it made for a lovely week. And I want to recommend that to you. I thought about, do I behold creation the way that God did? Do I see that it's very good? Oh, I remember when I first moved to New England, I was just so carried away with the beauty of the four seasons, something I didn't, had not experienced in, in Massachusetts. You know, to look up at the expanse of the sky and to see what I was always taught, there are billions of stars. Now we know that there are billions of galaxies. <laughs> Maybe about six per person in this world. We need a God that's that big. The beauty of the sunrises and the sunsets. Am, am, I, am I beholding creation? Well, I have been uh, reading a, a biography of, of Frederick Douglass. That's, that's my current read, David Blight's biography of Frederick Douglass who was one of the great orators of the 19th century, probably the most famous Afri African, -America, African American in, in that time. He had been a slave 
who, who was beaten badly. And in his youth, when he shifted from the field to the shipyards, he carved out some time to learn how to read and to write. And not only that, but he gathered other slaves around him to teach them how to read and to write. And it set loose one of the greatest minds in America. I mean, one of the great thinkers and writers and speakers. And at one point, uh, heroically, he escaped slavery and became a fugitive slave. And he, he made his way to a free state. And it was there in the 1840s that he began to speak from village to village, from town to town, against the sin of slavery. And he became one of the most, one of the greatest abolitionist speakers of all time. In the 1840s, some two decades before we outlawed slavery, he called to our attention by the power of his words, by pure moral suasion about this essential sin in America called slavery. He was, by the way, he's one of the greatest preachers in this country. I know you might not think of Frederick Douglass as a preacher, but he was actually trained by another black preacher and was licensed to preach and was called reverend. That's how he learned to be an orator. And, and you ought to read his speeches. His speeches are sermons calling us to higher ground. He spoke to hundreds of thousands of people each year. And, and, and at one point in one of his sermons, uh, he gathered up his six-foot, two-inch frame, and he extended his long arms out and with his beautiful hair which was perfectly parted he said behold I am a human being and he said that at a time when black folk weren't thought of as fully human beings. People couldn't imagine an African having this kind of power, this kind of presence, this kind of mind, this kind of beauty. They couldn't imagine a fully human Behold, I am a human being. He helped us to behold the basic dignity of every human being. Behold, I know it's no longer in the Bible, but I'm going to keep preaching, behold. <laughs> are you beholding, are you appreciating the good things around you? We become what we behold. Are you, are you beholding the goodness, the beauty, the glory of Jesus Christ? We become what we behold. Are you, uh, are you beholding the good things in the people around you? We become what we behold. I was um, telling a friend this week where I live uh, about what I was going to be preaching. She actually asked me what I was going to be preaching, so I told her what I, about this sermon, and she says, oh, she said, you know, I just love it in a wedding. You know, when the couple are making their vows, you know, they say uh, uh, to have and to behold. I, I, 
couldn't bring it to myself to correct her. I mean, that's not what the vows say. It's, it, it, it's to have and to hold from this day forward, you know, in sickness and health and so forth. But I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to correct her because in a real way, she had it so right to see each other, to have, and to behold. Behold the beauty of our Lord, the love and the glory of Jesus Christ. Behold. Amen.